So we've talked about conservation of mass and conservation of momentum now. We're going to go on to conservation of energy, but we have to talk about Bernoulli equa the Bernoulli equation first. It's probably the most well-known uh, equation in fluid mechanics. I'm sure you've seen it in high school and probably physics as well. And it's, it's actually a statement of conservation of energy, but it has a bunch of conditions on it. So here's the basic form of the Bernoulli equation, p over gamma plus b squared over 2g plus z equals a constant, and this is in the FE handbook in this format. You can find this equation in a variety of other formats. Your book, I think, relies primarily on this one below. I'm not going to use that form because I think the form above fits nicely into the full conservation of energy equation, and it, I, it's more meaningful in, in uh, this version. So I'm going to stick with this, but you can use any form you want, actually. Um, and as I said, it's a statement of conservation of energy. If I remind you of high school physics where you talked about potential energy and kinetic energy, and if you take a big rock and you roll it up a hill, you've gained potential energy with it just sitting on top of the hill. And then if you give it a shove and it rolls down the hill, that potential energy gets converted into a velocity, and we call that kinetic energy. And, and, and this equation is the same way. It's saying that there's a, there's a kinetic energy or a velocity head. We're going to use head in terms as a description for energy from now on. So a fluid has a velocity component to it. It's also got an elevation component to it. And the sum of those has to remain constant. So if you increase velocity, you're going to lose elevation, and vice versa. If you lose elevation, you're probably going to increase velocity. Um, but the new thing here with fluids is this pressure term. In addition to elevation and velocity, fluids can also store energy in terms of pressure. So there's some balance between these three things, and energy flows from one form to another. And if energy is conserved within a flow, the sum of these things, these three things always has to be constant. So you can convert energy from pressure head to velocity head, or from velocity head to elevation head, but the sum always has to stay constant. Now I said there's a bunch of conditions that we have to consider. The first assumption is called the inviscid flow assumption. Inviscid literally means a fluid with no viscosity and there is no such thing, but um, a viscosity is the source of our energy losses within a flow. So if we're assuming no energy loss due to friction and turbulence within the flow, what we're essentially saying is the flow it has no vis or the fluid has no viscosity. So this is simply an assumption that there's no energy loss within the flow itself. We also have to assume that the flow is incompressible, and we've done this before. This works for all liquids, and it also works for gases that are flowing at velocities much lower than the Mach number. We have to assume steady flow, that is the flow doesn't change in time. And then we also have to apply this along a streamline. So what this says is that the points the points where we pick our Bernoulli points, or where we're going to apply the Bernoulli equation, have to be connected. The flow has to be able to get from one point to another if we're going to expect that energy is going to be conserved. So if we've got two liquids that aren't connected, we wouldn't expect the energy to be the same in those two flows. It's got to be along a streamline. And then finally, we're going to assume there's no other sources or losses of energy within the flow. So a pump adds energy to a fluid system and a turbine sucks energy out of a fluid system. So we can't have any of that. All right, here's, we're going to do one quick example. Now this is, uh, I've seen this in several fluids books. I'm not sure if the animal behaviorists, behavioralists really um, would agree with this or not, but here's how the story goes. Um, prairie dogs, of course they build these, these underground warrens which are uh, pretty complex and, and large. 
they always build at least one hole that is much higher than the others. And and this takes a bit of effort. They're they're usually in pretty flat land and they they actually construct a big mound around the opening, around one of the openings. And the reason for this is to generate flow through their burrow. Um, so let's say we have a burrow with two openings, and one opening is one meter higher than the other. Let's calculate the pressure difference between the two. What happens is as air flows across here, the air over the burrow gets compressed, and you get a higher velocity. So if we've measured the velocities at 6 and 6.42, what's the pressure difference between those two holes? So I'm going to pick two Bernoulli points along a streamline and I'm going to pick them above each of the burrows where we have velocity measurements and also where we want to get estimate pressure differences. We write the Bernoulli equation at those two points and what we're saying is the sum of the three heads has to be the same at each of those points. We can look up um, a gamma for air at standard temperature and pressure and I'm going to rearrange to get pressure difference which is what the question asks for. And now we've got all our information. We just plug in the numbers and solve and what you do see is that there is a pressure difference from one hole to the other. What this means is if you have a pressure difference it's going to drive airflow from the high pressure point to the low pressure point so that their burrows are ventilated. Pretty, pretty cool if they actually really do this and it's intentional. Okay, so that was an example of how you use Bernoulli. It's pretty straightforward. The key is to pick Bernoulli points. So the first step is to pick some Bernoulli points and then write the equation at those points. So the real key is um, picking the right points. And sometimes it's not obvious. Some hints. Um, you want to make sure you pick points that answer the question. So in the last problem, we wanted pressure difference through above the two warrens or the two holes. So we want to have points above those holes or else we can't answer the question. And then the second thing we want to do is we want to simplify our equation. And I'll give you some pointers on that. Um, a common, common things that we run into are large vessels and free jets. If I pick Bernoulli points at the surface of the large vessel and in the free jet, write the Bernoulli equation, what you see at point A in the large vessel, it's right at the surface of the water, so the pressure is equal to zero. This is gauge pressure, of course. You can also say the velocity is essentially equal to zero. Now, if, if water is flowing out B, there will be some movement in the water in the tank. But what we're saying is the tank is large enough that the velocity or the movement of water at the surface is so small compared to everything else, it's insignificant. Okay, and, and that's where this term large comes from. This has to be, we have to consider, or we have to assume that this tank is big enough so that that velocity is insignificant. And then in the free jet, of course, we've said before that pressure in the free jet is always zero. So that's a good place to pick a point as well because you can, you'll lose the pressure term. Incidentally, if we solve this, we get the velocity coming out of the jet equals the square root of 2gh. Um, this is in the FE handbook, and it, it's sometimes useful if you want to calculate the velocity in a free jet. Okay, let's do one more example. Um, we've got a water supply pipe that's under pressure, 60 psi, which is typical of a water supply pipe to your house. Let's say you poke a hole in it and water jets up into the air. How high will that water jet up? and then why is your answer bogus? I'm going to pick two Bernoulli points, one in the center of that pipe um, in, and then another one at the top of the jet. Write the Bernoulli equation at those two points and in the center of the pipe I'm assuming the pipe is large enough that the flow out of that tiny little hole doesn't really generate much flow within the pipe itself. So the velocity in the pipe, I'm going to say, is equal to zero. And the um, elevation is going to be equal to zero. I'm going to set that as my datum. 
and then in the free jet obviously the pressure is zero and I also picked the point right at the top of the spray so this is right where it's stationary for a second and then starts to fall back down again so the velocity there is zero so this reduces to a really simple equation the elevation is just p over gamma and you calculate that you would be able to spray water 138 feet up in the air so that's kinda crazy right imagine that you've got your hose outside and you've got a faucet or a, a nozzle connected to it theoretically you should be able to spray that water almost 140 feet up in the air with your nozzle and anyone who's ever had a water fight knows that that's not possible it'd be nice if it was possible but we know that's not possible so so why is this answer bogus and this is one thing you gotta be careful with Bernoulli is we've assumed there's no energy losses turns out when you spray water up in the air there's there's tons of energy losses as the water interacts with the air so sometimes Bernoulli um, can give you really misleading answers so you do have to be careful about those assumptions you've made um, but I would like to point out that if if you didn't spray it in the air if you connected a tube to that hole you you would actually be able to lift the water 140 feet which is pretty amazing